Hello, I'm Lenny Pinna, and I'm the editor of this book, A Face from Uranus, Correspondence Between Ted Burr and Henry Bellaman, 1943 to 1945. I'm also the screenwriter for the TV series In the Name of Jamie Wakefield, which is based on the letters in this book. I'm picking up with part two of episode two, which was called Hidden in Bellevue. You may recall at the end of the scene between Paris Mitchell and Vera Lashinsky, the characters in Henry's novel. Uh, Paris has just proposed that he and Vera have an affair and that he says his wife will not find out. There was a knock at the door. The knock at the door was not in the scene. The knock at the door takes us back to Henry's reality in real life. So, knock at the door. There's an offstage voice. It's Jocelyn the maid. Mr. Henry, yes, come in. Jocelyn enters with a tray with tea and Henry's mail. Thank you, Jocelyn. You're very welcome, Mr. Henry. Sorry to disturb you. It looks like you're busy writing. That I am. It's good to see the power of prayer is working. Please keep it up because I have a long way to go. We all have a long way to go, Mr. Henry, and that's why we give thanks and praise each and every day to keep us going. No biscuits today? I'm sorry to say that Miss Catherine informed me that I'm not to make you some of your favorite foods. Did she now? She said on account of the doctor being concerned about your heart. I'm not happy about it but I suppose she's right. I'm not happy about it either, but one must abide by what's meant for our own good. It's the same with God. I've had to learn how to abide. I understand. I've had to learn to abide as well. But God is blessing your writing now, so I'm going to let you get back to your work, and I'm going to get back to mine. Amen. After she exit, Henry takes a sip of tea, he sees a thick blue envelope in the stack of mail. It captures his attention. He pulls it from the stack and reads the return address. There is a close-up of the letter. It says, Ted Burr, 161 Sheffield Street, Bellevue, Ohio. He cuts the envelope and retrieves a very long letter. He begins reading, and we hear Ted in voiceover. These were my very thoughts after I had read your letter. I had hardly dared expect an answer, yet here it was, kind and inviting. We then cut to Ted's bedroom in the evening when he is typing the letter, and there's a close-up of his illumined face, and we hear Ted say, A part of you had found a way to me, insignificant me, how proud I am and grateful. We cut back to Henry's study, and he now stands and moves to a high back upholstered chair, which is by the window. We hear Ted say, You have brought me happiness, a zest for the future, so I shall tell you my story, the whole story. Cut back to Ted typing. We hear his voiceover. I regret to say that it isn't a pretty story, but King's Row has instilled within me such an admiration and faith in you that I shall not hesitate in throwing open my very soul. We cut back to Henry's study, and he feels a little bit of a heart disturbance. He holds the letter and his arm to his chest, closes his eyes, takes a couple of deep breaths. He then opens his eyes and resumes reading. Ted's voiceover. I was born July 26, 1924, so I am 19 years old. Not long ago, my mother confessed that before my birth, she prayed that I would be a girl. She desperately wanted a daughter. If only my mother's prayers had been answered. Yes, my troubles began when I was very young because I thought I was a girl. Henry stops abruptly, his eyes narrow in disbelief. He drinks some tea, and then he forges on to read the letter. We dissolve to the Burr family home, outside the home, next to the neighbor's house, where six-year-old Ted and his older sister Martha 
are playing with several girls from the neighborhood. A couple of the girls finish dressing Ted in baby doll clothes. He then climbs into the buggy to be pushed around. Ted, become, Ted beams as the girls giggle with delight. We then cut to when he's eight years old. We're inside the Burr home on the stairs and hallway, and Teddy is skipping on his way up to his room. His maternal grandmother can be seen through the open doorway of her bedroom. This is Grandma French, his maternal grandmother, as opposed to his paternal grandmother, Grandma Burr, who was sitting on the porch in the pilot. Grandma French uh, had died during the years of the pilot, so uh, this is a flashback to when she was alive, and um, she calls to Ted. Teddy, come Teddy, come see my beautiful jewels. Ted enters her bedroom and goes to the jewel box she has opened for him to see. He peruses the items and holds up a few pieces. Grandma French sits in her chair and reaches for her prayer book and her hair comb on the side table. Teddy, come comb Grandma's hair. With dedicated interest, Teddy takes the comb and from behind her chair, he slowly combs his grandmother's very long white hair while she reads her prayer book quietly aloud. We go back to Henry's study and we see that his memory is triggered. We dissolve to a memory of his own childhood in his grandmother's home, which is where he lived. And this is Grandmom Osfall. She was a German immigrant. She's finishing sewing a white ruffled collar and ruffled cuffs on Henry's school shirt. An eight-year-old Henry sits at the dining room table reading his schoolwork. Heinrich, come, put this on. Henry goes to her, takes off the shirt he is wearing. Over his undershirt, Henry puts on the ruffled collared shirt. Now put your jacket on. As Henry puts his jacket on, Grandmom Oswald adjusts the fluffs of the ruffled collar and further pulls out the cuffs. Stand tall. My goodness, you are the very picture of a proper young man. Henry grins. We dissolve back to Henry, who has the same grin on his face as he is remembering his grandmother. He resumes reading. We cut now to the exterior of a Bellevue neighborhood, neighborhood where there's a sand lot, and boys of varying age are picking teams for baseball. Ten-year-old Ted stands on the sidelines with another little boy. They're the last ones to be picked. Ted's two brothers, Lynn, the older one, and Mark, the younger, are already picked and on opposite teams. A boy on Lynn's team says, should I pick your brother? Lynn, no, we don't want the little sis on our team. Let Mark take him. So the boy says, I'll take Johnny. Lynn laughs, Mark, you get sissy. The boys on Mark's team grumble with disappointment. Mark sympathetically says, come on, Ted. Ted runs to Mark. I'll do my best, Mark. I, I promise. A boy says to Mark, Mark, why don't we let him keep score? He says to Ted, you want to keep score for us? Sure, anything. Uh, another boy says, you can also be our cheerleader. The boys giggle as they take the field, leaving Ted on the sideline. We go back to Henry's study, and there's a close-up of his, of his face, and we can see that he is sympathetic as he remembers his own childhood difference. We dissolve to his childhood home. Now 10-year-old Henry plays a composition on the piano. He hears boys playing outside. He stops playing and moves to the window. He slowly pushes the curtain aside just enough to peek out at the boys playing baseball across the street. His grandmother enters carrying a plate of pastry. Heinrich, why have you stopped your lesson? I was interrupted, Grandmom, by the sounds outside. Heinrich, you will accomplish so much more in this world than those silly boys out there. Keep practicing your concerto. Yes, Grandmom. Here is strudel for you when you are finished with your lesson. Young Henry smiles as he sits down to resume playing on the piano. 
we cut to a Bellevue grade school classroom. It's a sixth grade teacher is rigging up a white curtain and she's putting it over half of the classroom as she's creating a mock radio broadcast station. While everyone is helping to set up, Ted goes behind the curtain, steps up to the microphone, and begins to sing the Indian love call in a high soprano voice. When I'm calling you, will you answer true? The class stops, stunned by this beautiful voice. The teacher peeks behind to see who is singing. She is surprised and delighted to see it is Ted. We then cut to a Methodist church, the inside, it's choir practice, and Ted is belting out a solo hymn in the choir loft. He adds his own vocal flourishes throughout. The organ player struggles to play the hymn as written and looks helplessly toward the choir conductor. The choir director, who is enamored with Ted's virtuosity, speaks in a whisper to the organ player, just follow him, whatever he does. We then cut to the interior of a ladies' lodge in Bellevue. It's daytime, and Ted stands on a stage singing for the women's dinner party. The women are glowing with appreciation. Ted is singing Mother McCree. We then cut to the interior of the, bar, the Burr family car, where Ted is hiding in the back seat until his mother gets into the driver's seat of the car. Ted peeks up over the back of the seat. What did they say, Mom? What did they say? They said you could be in the movies. They think you are a, every bit as good as Bobby Breen. Ted beams with delight. We are now in the Burr's home living room at night. Extended family is celebrating the Christmas holiday. Everyone is listening to the Burr children play piano. Lynn, the oldest brother, finishes the last few bars of a very simple song, and everyone politely claps. Ted's mother, Teddy, will you play for us now? Everyone's excitement level raises as Ted sits at the piano. With poise and precision, he performs a challenging classical work. It is apparent that he is in his element, and he shows it off with ad added hand flourishes and a pleased-with-himself smile. He glances over at Lynn with a gloating look. He knows he is superior in this arena. Lynn's flushed face begrudgingly shows his inferiority in this area. We cut now to a neighbor girl's house during the day, and 13-year-old Ted and his sister Martha and the girls are dressing up in gowns and makeup. One of the girls says, oh, Look at Tadira French. Another girl, You look so beautiful in blue, Tadira. Ted, Does it bring out my eyes? Girl one, My goodness, yes. And girl two, you're wearing just the right amount of mascara, too. Martha he says, she has our mother's eyes. Feeling beautiful, Ted smiles radiantly with the attention. We cut to Henry's study. We can see Henry's expression is clearly uncomfortable with what he is reading. But we dissolve to a flashback in his mind, which is the interior of the Albert Berghauser home. We're in Albert's bedroom. They are both teenagers at this point. Albert's large bedroom is well appointed with frilled curtains and polished wood furniture. Albert pulls the bed covering off the bed and wraps it about his shoulders like a cape with a long train. Sometimes I like to pretend I'm one of the royal family. I tie this on and let it trail behind me. Albert demonstrates as he walks slowly across the room with a regal demeanor. Henry is fascinated by Albert's uninhibitedness. Albert slowly pivot turns so that the long train drapes sensuously around him and his legs. Albert role plays. 
I command you to kneel before me. Henry hesitates with some embarrassment. Albert keeps his composure and waits. Henry summons up the courage to participate in the role-playing, and he moves to Albert, kneeling before him. Albert extends his right hand gracefully in front of Henry's face, signaling it is Henry's duty to kiss his hand. Henry looks at the hand and then up at Albert. Albert raises an eyebrow with an expectation for Henry to obey him. His eyes twinkle, though, as he curls his lip to signal, I'm playing with you. Henry melts with Albert's subtle humor. He fully commits to the part he is being summoned to play. With reverence, he extends his hand palm up to take Albert's hand and slowly, solemnly kisses the back of it. He then looks up to Albert with a devotional look and a pleased with himself performance. Surprised by Henry's rise to the occasion, Albert is profoundly moved, and he feels quite vulnerable and exposed. He breaks the moment suddenly and walks away and removes the cape. Henry doesn't move. He realizes the truth of their relationship has just been revealed in that moment. We dissolve back to Henry's study. He lingers in his thoughts for a moment, returning to the present. He sips some tea and resumes reading. We cut to the exterior of a main street in Bellevue. 14-year-old Ted and his sister Martha walk down the street window shopping. Ted wears makeup and his hair is perfectly coiffed. He wears feminine slacks and blouse. He and Martha relate as sisters. While walking on the sidewalk, they notice Joan and her mother coming toward them in their signature arm-in-arm -arm walk with perfectly synced steps. Their matching periwinkle blue taffeta dresses are somewhat outdated, but still quite haute couture for Bellevue. Various heads in the town turn and look and snicker as they look at them. The two women, as they pass Ted and Martha, shyly smile and nod at Ted and Martha, and Ted puts, after they pass, Ted puts his arm in Martha's arm. They giggle at themselves as they start to mimic Joan and her mother walking in similar synced fashion. They also turn a few heads. We cut to the interior of a women's clothing store. Ted looks through a fashion magazine. Martha emerges from a dressing room in a new dress. My, that fits you perfectly. What do you think, Ted? It does fit you well, but the color doesn't complement you at all. Martha says to the sales clerk, does the dress come in any other color? She condescends, I'm afraid not. It is one of a kind. Martha says, oh well. And she turns back to the dressing room. The sales clerk, you don't want it then? Martha over her shoulder, no, the color won't do. As Martha re-enters the dressing area, the sales clerk glares somewhat irritatingly at Ted. Ted senses her disapproval, so he flips through the pages of the fashion magazine with a pretend haughtiness to avoid her eyes. We now move to a scene when Ted is uh, 14 years old, and he is riding a bicycle on the streets of Bellevue in the early morning on a paper route. And um, he stops at this mansion, and I'm going to show you that mansion right here. It is the uh, John Wright Mansion, which was built in 1880. So Ted rides past this mansion all the time, and he's, all, he's been conjuring up the, um, a sense of what goes on this, in this abandoned mansion, and he dreams up this very pretentious and haughty family. And uh, he starts to imagine a story, and he populates that story with his own family. So we watch the scene dissolve into the mansion. We're in, say, the living room, and the family are all in very extravagant clothing. 
and we just see that is this Ted's imagination is starting to conjure a story about them. This um, happens to be exactly what inspired Ted to write the novel the, Tur the Surf in Terror Fled about Sidney French. So as you also can maybe gather, Sidney French has the last name French of his grandmother, Grandma French. Um, I'm going to end here, and uh, we'll pick up next time with part three of episode two. If you have any questions or comments or, you know, want to discuss something that's going on, uh, feel free to make comments and, uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it. Thanks for joining me and see you next time.